No, thanks. Good morning, everyone. Settle down. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this session on uh, the financial aftershocks that may lie in the region in East Asia. Of course, Indonesia, where we are at the moment, a remarkable transformation, one which has been, well, started off in two decades ago with the liberalization that we saw in India and then in China. And of course, this is where we are now in a region which has favorable demographies and things that basically the developed world just doesn't have at the moment and all of this is loving uh, moving into this wonderful well seemingly inexorable uh, straight line of growth or is it that's what we're here to decide Jamie Dimon's daughter asked asked him once dad what's a financial crisis and he said it's something that happens every seven years <laughs> so, well what's going to happen in the next three or four years well my panelists today I'm joined here by uh, well, the Minister of Finance for Indonesia. We have uh, the Honourable Agus Motoda Dojo. And to my left, Michael Buchanan from uh, Goldman Sachs. Stuart Gulliver, Chief Executive of uh, uh, HSBC. And then we have, of course, Omar Lodi there. He's from Abraj Capital. Jeff Riddle from Zurich Financial and the Deputy Governor of the Bank of Indonesia there as well, Molinan Haddad. I'm going to start off with everybody just giving a couple of minutes of their viewpoint of the subject material and then we'll move on from there and perhaps shed some light as well as I hope a little bit of heat as well. So I'm going to start things off with my left, Michael Buchanan. Thanks very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I thought um, you know, I would just try and separate it a little bit into some two uh, key issues. One is in the short term uh, for the region uh, where I think in a number of countries uh, in, in Asia, interest rates uh, remain below at least where we think uh, they, they should be for long-run equilibrium. And that is leading to some pressure in terms of asset price bubbles, uh, in particular in some of the housing markets. Uh, and so I, I think, uh, you know, to some extent, uh, I think to some extent the, the longer-term uh, developments that are required as well will, will, will help with these issues. But in the meantime, in a world of very, very low uh, U.S. interest rates, which we expect uh, will continue through uh, until 2013, uh, it's going to be very important uh, for uh, Asian uh, monetary authorities and, uh, and governments to maintain a focus on managing uh, monetary policy uh, in a uh, world where interest rates are below equilibrium. And that, of course, means macroprudential uh, measures. Uh, and so uh, I think we'll continue to see uh, more of that. But in the longer term, you know, I think uh, one of the, uh, the key issues is about harnessing the high savings rates uh, within, uh, within Asia. Now, often that, uh, including from uh, sort of well-known uh, central bank governors in the West, that's described as the Asian savings glut. Whereas I, I think outside China, it's much more an investment dearth than a savings glut. Uh, and that brings us back to the need to develop local bond markets. You've got a lot of savings, but they're not really being channeled uh, necessarily in the most efficient ways. And I think you know, this region knows very well the risks from uh, having uh, FX exposures, having uh, maturity mismatches uh, from uh, the Asia crisis, but, uh, and, and a lot of progress has been made. But I think to harness the, the savings uh, in the region, to get that into infrastructure, uh, further development of the local uh, bond market, uh, clearing uh, processes and so on, is, uh, is absolutely crucial uh, to making the most from the, uh, the savings rates here. Let's move on to Stuart. Stuart, uh, I think, comes from a similar sort of viewpoint, don't you? Yeah, I think our view is that, that clearly Asia actually hasn't decoupled from the rest of the world, uh, that some of the capital flows that have come into Asia are as a result of the lack of investment opportunities in the West, uh, possibly also as a result of QE2 uh, and the actions that have been taken in the US and in the West in response to the global financial crisis, that that has caused some of the currency appreciation that we've seen in Asian currencies over the last 12 months or so, and although some of the Asian countries, Indonesia is one, are beneficiaries of, therefore, the apparent boom in India and China that's led to commodity prices rising, 
there are inflationary pressures around and there is the need to um, anchor the financial stability of the Asian countries by um, building out particularly bond markets, uh, particularly harnessing uh, the need to uh, capture some of the savings that now exist within a growing middle class in Asia Pacific and recycle it from simply sitting in bank deposits. I mean, the high savings rate partly reflects a lack of social stability, a lack of social welfare network in, uh, underpinning in this part of the world, but it also reflects a lack of investment opportunity. So if you start to build out bond markets and contractual savings, that also helps solve things like the bottlenecks and in infrastructure that exists in this part of the world. But, but I think our, our, our point is, you know, Asia hasn't decoupled itself from the rest of the world. And actually Asia still needs in many, many countries to build out strong bond markets. It's interesting if we go back to the Asian crisis, and actually I was in Hong Kong at the time, the places that survived best, which was Hong Kong and Singapore, did so because they actually had developed bond markets. Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to Jakarta, Indonesia. Of course, I will start with a brief view about Indonesia. Uh, Indonesia, for the last five years, uh, our economy continued to grow. Average, we grew 5.7% for the last five years. Even though there was a global crisis in 2009, we still can grow positive 4.5%. The economic growth of Indonesia for the next five years will uh, be around 6.3 to 6.8 percent. In 2014, we hope we can grow 7 to 7.7 percent. In Indonesia, basically, we have a good economy starting from the balance of payment. Our balance of payment in 2010 was $30 billion. And it's really improving because last year, in 2009, it was $12 billion. And uh, with that uh, balance of payment, we can improve our foreign exchange reserve. Uh, in 2005, our foreign exchange reserve was still $30 billion. Now it's already $116 uh, billion. In the area of fiscal, Indonesia very uh, strong and disciplined in monitoring the fiscal. Our budget is a budget deficit. But for the last 10 years, we keep and manage our budget deficit never exceeding 2%. Uh, last year, it was 0.6%, and this year is 1.8%. Hopefully, 2012 will be 1.4 to 1.5%. We believe to have a healthy fiscal is important to, to to convince the global community that will continue invest in Indonesia. One other thing that I would like to share with you is regarding the total government debt over GDP. In 2001, that was still 77%. In 2005, it was 39%. But in 2011, it's already 26%. So we continue to decrease total government debt over GDP. And we believe with that, uh, indicators, it will prove that even though we have a budget deficit, it's still healthy. One other point that I would like to share, and probably Ms., uh, Mr. Haddad will then elaborate, is banking sector. We have a healthy banking sector because crisis can come from the banking sector. In Indonesia, uh, the, total economy, the total credit growth last year was still 22%. Non-performing loan is around 2.6% gross basis, while uh, liquidity, loan to deposit ratios, and others are healthy. Look at the capital market of Indonesia. Last year, our capital market can grew 46%, the best in Asia Pacific. Uh, now, year to date, still uh, around 4%. So, uh, capital market, fiscal, monetary are in healthy position. But we need to be careful. Indonesia has some challenges. Uh, Indonesia has to improve the infrastructure. Indonesia has to improve the coordination uh, between central government and uh, local government. And we understand that in the region there is a risk of overheating economy and probably credit boom. So that we would like to, to, to discuss with you in this session. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Jeff Riddle. Thank you. Um, you know, I come from the insurance industry, and we tend to look at this uh, through our own lens. But 
The lens I'd go to is the Global Risk Report, which we're heavily involved in creating. And the Global Risk Report brings out a variety of issues. One of the things it recommends is that countries should have chief risk officers. Now, that can take many ways. I'd argue that the chief risk officer is in most cases the central bank head and uh, that the G20 are trying to take on that as a global role. What we would observe is that we're dealing with many of the symptoms of the financial crisis, but some of the de deep causes haven't been got rid of. And I'll upset the economists by being too simple here, but if you look at global imbalances, we've still got a situation where manufacturers are financing the customers to buy from them, and that isn't a long-term sustainable situation, and it will cause other problems to arise. Because of that dynamic, we are in a totally interconnected world. I think Stuart's exactly right there. And as Michael says, interest rates are still very low, which means that risk isn't necessarily being priced correctly. And we've got other stresses out there which are to do more with growth than with the financial side. But we have got restrictions on the... Uh, volume of food, water, the food, water, energy nexus that we talk about in the Global Risk Report. Those get exacerbated and fiscal strains get exacerbated by subsidies in much of the emerging markets and our premise would be that subsidies are bad things. So in summary we see an awful lot of risk still out there. We think it's vital that the central banks and G20 take on their role of holistically looking at this, otherwise we will end up with an unpredictable but future crisis. Yep, uh, Deputy Banker Governor Haddad. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, it seems to me there are two important initiatives after the crisis. The first one very much related how we have to stabilize our financial system and that's can, the second one is how we can support uh, the economic growth. So this is very much uh, the issues that we are uh, uh, involved uh, uh, so far. Uh, as far as the financial stability issues, um, as mentioned earlier by our minister, that uh, overall situation is, is, is it seems in good shape. Uh, in banking in particular, uh, our focus very much on the how we have to improve the liquidity and the capital of the industry, which is very much important. It is also in line with the global initiative uh, under the G20 and the Financial Stability Board. We are looking uh, very closely the, all this initiative because we are a member of this group. And then we are, will be reviewed by our peers uh, as far as the uh, financial uh, situation of our banking industry. So it seems to me uh, uh, up to this point, uh, the financial stability issues very much uh, the issues uh, lies on how we have to improve for the future uh, uh, vulnerabilities. Of course, the issues on the inflows, capital inflows, very much the, uh, remain one of our focus at the moment. Uh, uh, it, is, it is very significant that we have to take into, uh, into consideration uh, the appreciation of our currency because the uh, 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 capital inflows and also the uh, the, uh, you know, our competitiveness and uh, exchange rate issues related to this. That's why then uh, it is part of the, uh, our day-to-day -day, uh, monitoring very closely on these particular issues. So in, in overall, uh, uh, very much the issues on, uh, not on the macro, but very much on the micro side, how we have to improve the governance of the industry, for example. Uh, it is very much important in particular related how we have to improve the capacity, how to manage the risk, for example, is, is, is part of the uh, major initiative. Uh, as a G20 member, I think we also concern on the discussion as far as uh, how we have to manage the GCVs, I mean the global CVs that now being discussed at the global level. Uh, we are hosting a lot of GCVs here in Indonesia because of our open economies and our, our open financial system. But this is creating a little bit concern from us as a host country uh, because uh, something happened in head office over there somewhere 
around the globe, but you know, uh, it's uh, uh, sp maybe uh, creating kind of spillover to our uh, financial uh, industry here in Indonesia. That's why then uh, uh, we are thinking uh, how we have to manage this situation. Uh, people in other uh, part of the world thinking about the uh, uh, kind of uh, ring fencing activity uh, into this uh, global spillover uh, issues. That's why then it is very important uh, managing uh, the healthiness of the industry and individual bank is important, not only domestic bank, but also the uh, 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 foreign banks here in Indonesia. Thank you very much. Omar Lodi. Uh, just quickly, I mean, I think it's important to recognize where Asia has come from in the past 10 years. And today, going where we stand, yes, the heady sort of economic growth, the cheap credit uh, from the U.S., etc. The question around asset bubbles is an important one. As a private equity firm, you know, with a five, six year sort of investment horizon and the investments we make, we think that the fundamentals uh, of uh, the Asian economies are strong so that <coughs> it's not necessarily a hard landing, but perhaps a slowdown in growth over the next 12, 18 months that we might be looking at. The, what, what concerns us more is the fact that, as many of you all have said, that we are, a, you know, we are connected with the global world. And the situation in the West is not that straightforward. We have dependencies. Uh, so we can talk about bipolar growth models, but we can't talk about a decoupling. And I think our economies in Asia need to work um, harder towards, therefore, mitigating that risk that might sort of appear over the next two or three years with stagflationary environments in the West through domestic consumption policies and, in our opinion, infrastructure and capital formation, which has been lagging. Well, Mark, thank you very much indeed. I'd like to start off with uh, posing a question to uh, Finance Minister Agnes. Uh, with the way Indonesia has been growing, you're looking at 7.5% growth, you just said, by in the next couple of years or so. What are the risks you see ahead? Now, this is at the nub of the issue. What are the risks you see and how do you actually mitigate against those? We'll come to that in the second part of the, uh, uh, the debate. But uh, what do you think the biggest problem is? QE2 comes to an end, quantitative easing too, so this wall of liquidity is perhaps being taken out of the system. How does Indonesia cope with that? Thank you. Uh, I think I agree with you that uh, even though we plan to improve uh, the economic growth of Indonesia, and not only economic growth, but make sure that it's uh, equity, it's, uh, it's uh, something that can be enjoyed by, by the, 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 the people of Indonesia. And uh, we believe uh, one of the risks is, of course, uh, now we have a uh, large capital inflow to Indonesia and there's a possibility when the U.S. or advancing economies improve the interest rate and then there will be a uh, 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 reversal. Uh, but as I said, uh, we in Indonesia, we really would like to strengthen to make sure that we have a strong uh, pillars, especially the monetary, fiscal, and uh, the real sector. Uh, coordination uh, among institutions, coordination Ministry of Finance with the Bank Indonesia, with the Deposit Insurance Agency, we continue to have that coordination. And other countries. And, and other countries too, yes. Uh, and uh, basically, we have the crisis management protocol, and for managing the, 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 the capital flow, uh, we have a bond stabilization framework, and we have that bond stabilization framework in coordination with central bank. So we have uh, funds basically already been approved by our parliament. It's a special funds for buy back the government bonds. But we also work together with Central Bank, and Central Bank will, will use the, the foreign exchange reserve uh, to stabilize the government bonds, for instance. And then we have the bond stabilization framework. Uh, basically, uh, 14 uh, state-owned insurance agencies, banks, and financial institutions, they work together to stabilize the bonds if necessary. And then we can use uh, budget surpluses, uh, revenue minus uh, spending, if there is a surplus, we have the authorization to use the, the fund for stabilizing the, 
the, the, the, the bonds in, in, in Indonesia. But uh, in general, we will have a good coordination and make sure that we have prudent fiscal, macroeconomic, and fiscal uh, policy. And we continue to, uh, to attract uh, foreign, direct, foreign direct investment and domestic investment. So we have uh, conferred the portfolio investment to a more uh, foreign direct investment, a real sector, real sector uh, uh, initiatives. I think Michael wants to dive in. Well, I was just going to sort of compliment Indonesia on the way uh, it's reacted to this uh, sort of situation of big inflows and outflows, uh, partly uh, from quantitative easing. Uh, and I think uh, the, the framework in which you put that is, is very, very encouraging because to me, you know, in a lot of the discussions that, um, that I have with policymakers in the region, there's an assumption that you know, exchange rate volatility is always bad. Um, whereas in Indonesia, because you've managed to tackle the uh, foreign currency debt problem uh, from uh, the, the 90s and you have low debt ratios and you have more credible uh, institutions, then currency flexibility can actually be a very good thing. Uh, and so during the crisis, the, the, the recent uh, credit crisis, some depreciation can help ease financial conditions. But that only works if you have uh, enough of your debt in local currency, you don't have too much in foreign currency, uh, if inflation expectations aren't unhinged, and then you get the easing of financial conditions. Then when you get the inflows coming back into the region, when the US looks weak and Indonesia and Asia look strong, uh, then that currency appreciation can help tighten financial conditions automatically. And I think Indonesia has done uh, a great job uh, at allowing uh, that, that currency flexibility, and that's being permitted because of the improvements in some of the, uh, the, the sort of debt, uh, local currency debt um, uh, some sort of arrangements you were, you were discussing? I think the I word came up there, didn't it, Stuart? Um, inflation. How do deeper capital markets mitigate inflationary expectations, inflationary risks, etc.? Um, well, I think they have a tangential impact, but the, the inflationary issue, I think, in, in Asia Pacific, I think all of us as business people face it. Um, uh, both wage price inflation, I think everyone here that's running a business in Asia sees extreme wage price inflation as Asia has replaced, in the eyes of most Western businesses, their domestic market as an opportunity to invest. And we see it actually rather more alarmingly at, at the um, grassroots level in the context of both energy and food, therefore, um, inflation. Uh, and it is worrying for countries that, that have still a large um, sector of poor people that obviously food and, and energy is a percentage of their disposable income is a dramatically higher percentage and therefore has a dramatically higher impact. Um, so, so I think the inflationary pressures are, are very, very real. Uh, as you say, Indonesia has benefited by letting the currency appreciate 14, 15 percent. That has had a tightening impact. Um, but the inflationary pressures that we see in, in the emerging markets are actually a product of the global imbalances that take place. Um, so you have got this huge wall of rather hot money that's come in seeking higher returns, fueled in part by the QE that has taken place in the Western world. Uh, and there isn't an, an obvious and easy solution to that other than, frankly, letting the currencies appreciate and letting um, interest rates rise, unless we're at a point where the cycle starts to turn and actually the US dollar itself starts to come back, uh, which is a possibility given that the weakening of the US dollar is now a fairly mature trade. Omar. Well, I think certainly the, the, the sting out of the inflationary concern has dissipated somewhat in the past six weeks or so with the come down in asset price and commodity prices, food prices, and I think prudent uh, sort of monetary policies that have been implemented in a number of countries. And today the debate very much here, India, et cetera, is a trade-off between high interest rates and a come down in growth. And I think that's an acceptable trade-off to make. Um, so I, th I don't think it's that concern necessarily that uh, uh, you know, keeps us awake at night, but certainly you know, coming back to the Western world and our dependencies, I mean, if you look at across the ratios, you know, our exports of Asia still today constitute 42% of GDP. Uh, FDI flows still constitute 3.3% of GDP. We saw all of these volatilities play out in the 08 crisis where our stock markets, property prices, fell dramatically as well in line with the Western world. Yes, we rebounded a lot faster. 
The same thing we've seen happening in our bourses over the last six weeks. So it's these concerns, and depending on what view you take of the Western economies, this is a, you know, and, and we don't have a particularly bullish view, for the next two, three years, growth and sustained growth at the seven, eight, nine percent levels in Asia is going to be impacted by that. And hence the mobilization around domestic consumption policies, domestic capital formation policies. I mean, consumption levels are fairly attractive and high in India and Indonesia, sort of 55, 56 percent, but remain low in, in, in China. And as the Chinese themselves would, uh, would, would acknowledge, it's not something that is necessarily going to change overnight. There are cultural factors that are going to take a generational change to spending patterns to come you know, uh, alongside sort of Western norms. There are structural factors in uh, pension reforms, healthcare reforms, that until these pillars are not sort of put in place, people, the wider population, are not going to necessarily spend freely uh, and widely. And then infrastructure. It's a huge uh, you know, bucket in terms of not just sustained future economic growth, but also its impact and its effects as a fiscal stimuli. Indonesia uh, and India, their fiscal, their infrastructure spending over the next five years accounts for 25 and 60 percent respectively of their 2010 GDP. So these are very significant numbers. But that base of infrastructure spending has been throated, has been muted, given legislative processes, given a lack of harmony in regulatory structures at a federal, state, and local council level, and frankly speaking, uh, you know, increasing sort of across Asia and a number of economies, transparency and governance issues that don't seem to be easing, but indeed have exacerbated, like in India today. Deputy Governor, do you think that you really can control inflation? Sorry, would you repeat this? Do you think you can really control inflation? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, very difficult to answer this question. So, um, well, uh, uh, we we still in the range of the optimist, uh, 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 optimist range of our uh, uh, capacity to handle this. You know, this uh, the food prices, commodity prices is very much perhaps one of our focus in the future. Uh, energy prices. Uh, but the rest of the items, it seems to me, uh, well, there is uh, expectation for the uh, uh, consumer expectation and then how we have to guide the, uh, the expectation so uh, we can manage this inflation into our uh, uh, range. You know. But so far, uh, uh, our uh, core inflation is still under manageable, at that level it's manageable. And then, uh, Fortunately, we got some uh, benefit from the, uh, the strengthening our currency because it uh, will uh, uh, a good impact to the, our uh, inflation at the moment. So overall, it seems to me uh, we are still uh, optimistic to see that uh, we can manage inflation uh, this year. Next year, very much related to the uh, uh, how we see the uh, future development of the. Uh, uh, energy prices and, and food prices and things like that. You know, that's, that's why then uh, it's very much depend on something beyond our jurisdiction. That, that, that's why then we, we are clo watching very closely on that particular item. So. I want to just change subjects a bit now and talk a little bit about what happened, of course, on March the 11th in Japan. And it seemed like a localized issue which could have been dealt with by Japan. But as time has worn on, it's become extreme, well, exceedingly an event that we're all feeling now, we're about to brace ourselves anyway to feel. And Jeff Riddle, from an insurer's point of view and a reinsurance point of view, is something you're looking at, I'm sure, very closely. So I'm not quite sure where you want me to go. I on just want to view, you know, these are natural disasters, and of course we can also get the shock from them as well. It's something that we can't really avoid, but how do we really okay. stop ourselves from feeling the impact too badly? How much can we build in? Okay, so, you know, the... When the quake happened, we got um, the knee-jerk and conventional reaction of uh, the yen must strengthen because uh, Japan has to repatriate to finance uh, the uh, rebuilding. And when uh, the dust settled, it became clear that Japan actually didn't need to repatriate to do that and was able to domestically um, 
finance that, and particularly the insurance companies uh, didn't need to bring money back, and the insured amount was uh, less than 10% anyway. The, there will be long-term effects of that refinancing in Japan, and I'm not sure I can predict where those are going to go. But the piece that I think is more fundamental is it showed up the global connectivities we've talked about in the supply chain strains that exist, which start to create indirect economic effect on a much broader global basis, um, and are very tough to predict. GM predicting a shortfall in income because of uh, loss of suppliers in Japan, then realizing that actually there was a degree of opportunity there because actually their main competitors were even more impacted than they were. So even within an industry, it's tough to predict it. Uh, and so from an insurance point of view, we'd say, well, supply chain insurance is vital. You've got to drive down it. You've got to understand it. From a more macro view, it's the fact that disruption in one country leaks over into disruption in other places in unpredictable ways that we're still not good enough at understanding and have to keep working at recognizing what are the pinch points that are going to cause global problems. Uh, I mean, in, in terms of you know, what we've seen with the, the impact of the, the tragic uh, quake in, in, in Japan, uh, I guess what I remember most is when we were first going through the, the kind of economic uh, sort of shock that would follow from that, uh, every little bit of information we got uh, kept getting worse. So, you know, the first question I asked was, you know, well, how important is Japan uh, in terms of overall sort of semiconductors in the auto industry? And the answer was, I think, around 10 to 15 percent. I thought, oh, it's not too bad. And then you ask, well, what about, you know, in individual parts? And, and so when you, when you got into the nitty-gritties, like anti-lock brakes, it's about 80 to 90 percent. And I think that's what we've seen a little bit uh, in a couple of countries uh, in the region here, including in Thailand, uh, and also, of course, in the U.S. Uh, but then I think the bigger question uh, and, and sort of the, uh, the, the broader risk in a way for, uh, for the U.S. and Asia and global growth at the moment is how much of the soft patch that we're seeing right now is due to that supply-side disruption disruption in Japan. Um, and when you look at the data in the US and in China, I think it's a little bit worrying at the moment. You know, in the US, uh, it's a very broad-based uh, slowdown, uh, including in the labor market. And that doesn't really smack of a couple of months of, I can't get the right widget. Um, and so I think it's perhaps, you know, more an issue of a very large output gap, um, not a huge need to invest, corporate sitting on cash balances. Uh, and so, well, you've had some improvement in consumption. It's not, so, it's not, not some building um, uh, there. And in China, when you look at the breakdown in, in terms of the PMIs in China, the sort of business confidence uh, surveys, uh, what you find is that uh, orders have fallen at least as much, if not more, than production in the last few months, and that inventories of finished goods have gone up. Whereas if you really thought this was a Japan-related supply-side slowdown, you know, what you'd expect to see uh, is that orders were holding up very nicely and production was falling because you couldn't get the, you know, the electricity, you couldn't get you know, the widget from Japan, um, and you're just not seeing that. So I, I think the slowdown feels in China to be a very demand-side policy-induced slowdown, and we don't expect that to change uh, for some months uh, yet until inflationary pressures subside. And in the U.S., it feels like a, a broader slowdown than just um, the, the tragic quake in, uh, in, in Japan. Yeah, let's move it on. And Stuart, you know, we're on top of a slowdown in the U.S., we keep on getting the phrase that uh, the can is being kicked down the road in Europe as well with the Greek crisis. It's being delayed more than anything else. If we do see a restructuring or a default on bonds there, what is the impact on our companies here ready for it? And what would be the impact, considering also 45% of this region is export-driven? I mean, the, 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 the discussions and debate over Greece uh, and therefore, Ireland and Portugal continue, obviously. Um, our expectations is not that there will be a default by Greece, um, but obviously the debate is really turning on whether pre-2013, which was the original agreed date, up until 2013, the IMF was standing in, um, there was no sense that there would be any restructuring or reprofiling. And it's that that's now effectively being debated. Will there be a reprofiling pre-2013? Um, uh, and, and the indication would be that if provided Greece can actually get the budget um, cuts in place and start to probably sell a number of assets, 
it's quite possible that this fresh package of money will be sufficient to get them through to that point in time. I think realistically, the debate around, or the question marks around Greece and then Ireland will remain a chronic problem for Europe for the foreseeable future, which from time to time will go through acute phases, which will show up in credit spreads for the peripheral countries. But the interesting thing is it's not shown up in weakness in the euro. So, so the quite interesting part is that every time the euro is weakened, actually Asian and Middle Eastern central banks have taken it as an opportunity to diversify out of US dollars and buy the euro. So the euro actually is stronger than before the euro crisis began, which is, which is possibly an indication of, of some other bigger trends taking place. But, but to your point about the fact that this part of the world is, is trade related and therefore dependent on how the European economies respond, I mean, it's back to the point we're all making that there is an absolute connectivity that runs throughout the world and booming times in Asia are part of a reflection of money seeking higher returns than it can find either in the United States because we would agree that there is a broad slowdown taking place or in Europe where there are question marks over the cost of the bailout, in essence, of, 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 of Greece, Ireland, Portugal. Um, the impact, though, of, of a reprofiling, which is the most, which is the terminology used for effectively extending the Greek debt in some way, clearly has been stress test as well. I mean, that's why the ECB has done and the FSB have done, you know, have looked at stress testing the European banks. So, so I'm not that worried that there will be a considerable unseen second order impact. But would we European see the bank. seizure of the liquidity in the system, the capital markets as a result, which can lead to all sorts of problems as we did see in 2007, 2008? There, there is a risk of that happening. The risk of that happening comes from contagion. So it comes from how the Greek situation is handled. If the Greek situation is handled in such a way as to cause the market to assume it's the start of more, more more being going into countries outside of the three I illustrated. And the, 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 what I'm talking about is when um, the rating agencies put Italy on um, negative outlook, that had a far greater impact on European markets than any debate about Greece. So it's the, con it's the contagion and the extent to which contagion is unforeseen and to Jeff's point is hard to map that causes basically to respond to, causes banks and insurance companies and pension funds to respond to that risk by becoming totally risk averse and then hoarding cash, which is why you then have this disruption in money markets. As things play out at the moment with Greece, there is no sign of that happening, but you can see where it will happen if you look at what did occur to credit spreads when Italy was put on negative outwatch. Finance Minister Agus, I mean, as a minister in this part of the world, uh, how concerned are you by events in, let's say, the United States or, of course, as we've just been discussing, Europe? Uh, regarding uh, the disaster, uh, let, uh, I would like to, to, to respond on that, uh, the, the, the disaster. In Indonesia, basically, we have to live with natural disaster. You, have, you heard about the tsunami in Aceh eruption in central Java, earthquake in West Java, flood disaster in Papua. Uh, in Indonesia, we don't have special initiative to, to cover disaster insurance or catastrophic insurance. But we continue to increase our budget for uh, natural disaster. Uh, we have special unit for managing that, and then we increase uh, 2 trillion rupiah to 4 trillion. But we have initiative with ASEAN, especially ASEAN plus three. Uh, we understand if there is a disaster, the disaster can really impact not only the country, but can uh, impact the neighbor country or the, 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 the regional. So in ASEAN plus three, ASEAN plus China, Japan, and Korea, we have initiative to develop uh, the disaster insurance and catastrophic uh, insurance. Uh, I'm sure it, 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 it will progress in 2011, and we will have that uh, uh, initiative uh, soon in Indonesia and in ASEAN uh, countries. The other thing is, uh, in Indonesia, we have a special law, and basically in that law, uh, we need to always involve uh, risk management unit, especially for disaster, for any uh, development. So we really need to make sure that all assessment 
especially the disaster risk management is there before we can uh, go with the, 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 the development initiative to make sure that we protect uh, the community and the people uh, of uh, Indonesia. I think that's what I want to respond to. I'm uh, just going to get me back to the interconnectivity of the world and this part of the world. How, I mean, we saw it's fairly well insulated after the collapse of Lehman Brothers. I mean, does that insulation continue now, or are we in a more precarious situation? I, th I, I think certainly in the context of Asia, there are sort of many fundamentals about the Asian economies that bolstered them well, even going into the 08 financial crisis. Certainly, yes, exports fell 30%. Property prices fell, growth rates halved in East Asia, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but the rebound was a lot swifter than it was uh, in the Western world because of structural issues and structural fundamentals here. Um, we are so is, Asia is in, a, in a, is in a stronger position, and I think there's been a continuation of those prudent policies. Yes, there are risks from all the things that we've discussed, but I think if, if governments in a concerted manner, continue to sort of be prudent, be conservative, be tight on the monetary front at the expense of growth, I think it can be mitigated to a great extent. The, the, the Western world, uh, post Lehman, I don't think the structural issue around the crisis has gone away. Uh, the debt has just gone from one coffer to another. We are deferring the issue. Um, and, and that will come to a head in some manner or form or the other. I mean, the U.S., where 70% of the U.S. consumer, the U.S. consumer that accounts for 70% of that country's GDP has gone from a negative savings rate to a forced savings rate, and that consumer is going to be down and out for the next three, four, five years. So who's going to sort of come and pick up the slack? And, and Europe, as Stuart said, you know, has its own structural issues and rigidities. Uh, and, you know, whether it's a, a sovereign crisis, uh, people talk about, a down rating of the U.S., which is Armageddon and probably far-fetched, but certainly uh, a deep, long, stagflationary environment in the Western world is, in, our, in my opinion, not uh, necessarily unforeseen. Jeff, I want to get your views on this as well. The, yeah, I, th I think uh, we've sort of summarized it already as a group, is unless... Asia can generate domestic consumption, the imbalances don't go away. Unless the West finds a way to regenerate growth, it's not going to discharge the debt issues that Omar was talking about. And we have lots of external threats in terms of um, the, uh, I referred to it before, the water energy food nexus creates lots of stresses, exacerbated in fact by the reaction to nuclear in Japan. And we've got, I'm going to sound very negative here, I'm actually cup half full. I think we will deal with it, but I think that the G20 discussions have to get more and more holistic than they've been. And it's the understanding of all the interconnectivities that is so difficult at the moment that has to be dealt with if we're going to get to the right path forward out of where we are. Well, I asked your finance minister about it. I'm going to put this question to the deputy governor now as well. You know, how concerned are you in Indonesia about uh, a slowdown in the rest of the world? Uh, well, uh, the bottom line is basically uh, we're very concerned on the probability of uh, capital reversal because of all this dynamic that happen in Europe and other parts of the world, you know. Uh, because it is very much our concern. It was happened when the first Greece crisis happened. Uh, I think we lost around four to five billion our uh, uh, foreign reserves at that time. So it's, it's very much the issues on uh, how we make sure that the stability of financial uh, system is intact and also at the same time, we have to take care of very much the issues that mentioned earlier, that uh, uh, the economy uh, should, you know, should uh, uh, grow in, 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 in more proper way in terms of these 
uh, the uh, stability, you know, inflation and then bubbles, things like that. It seems to me that we have to, to, to take this, uh, the balance between these two important things. But again, it's, it's very much the issues and uh, the concern very much on the, the possibility of reversal because of what happened in uh, recent debate in Europe on the Greece, for example, profiling, restructuring, whatever you name it, you know, because it's different uh, term that now being discussed. But actually, uh, reversal is very much the issues of emerging markets, I suppose. Michael, you wanted to make a point on this. Well, I was just thinking before, um, you know, so when, when um, Jeff was uh, commenting on the importance of consumption uh, in the region, uh, you know, I think something, uh, you know, has, has certainly changed over the last couple of years, uh, not for the better in a way in, in, in that sense, which is that uh, to get out of the crisis, uh, you know, China had, of course, an enormous uh, domestic demand stimulus. Now, admittedly, most of that was investment, but it's what, you know, I'd call sort of quasi-consumption investment, you know, schools, uh, hospitals, property, uh, they're investment because they're a durable asset, but it's, it's not uh, sort of factories and plant equipment, so it's not necessarily labor productivity enhancing in the, in the near term. So it's sort of quasi-consumption um, uh, investment. And that was a huge part of what got China and then subsequently the rest of the region sort of out of the, uh, the, the, the crisis. But when you look at the ability of China to do that again, it looks very different now. Uh, we have a very simple metric to help sort of guide us on this called excess credit growth, which is just the extent to which credit is going faster or slower than nominal GDP. Uh, and when you look at that, China was the only major economy in the world that had negative excess credit growth. In other words, delevered in all of the good years of this cycle before the global credit crisis. Uh, so it was at minus 15 when the rest of the world was at a plus 40 and above. But then if you look at that situation now, and particularly if you allow for the off-balance sheet lending the banks have um, undertaken in the last uh, two years, uh, it's risen by 50 percentage points of GDP in 2009 and 2010. So the ability of China to lever up, to finance a surge in quasi-consumption types of investment again has, I think, uh, largely disappeared. Uh, and so therefore you do need to, to create sort of true uh, sort of self-perpetuating uh, consumption growth. Uh, and that becomes very difficult because, uh, you know, again, just looking at China, uh, you know, you've still got massive implicit taxes uh, on the household sector and subsidies to the corporate sector from having interest rates many percentage points below equilibrium. Uh, and, of course, in a perverse way, the, the fact that they have that financial system is one of the reasons they could run such countercyclical policy. Because if interest rates are below equilibrium, then you as a government can turn the tap on and off very, very quickly because everyone wants more credit. So it's a, a very interconnected problem, I think, and, and that makes it a little bit more difficult to solve. Thank you, guys. I want to just kick it out to the floor now, and uh, if you put your hands up and wait for a mic, and identify yourself and your organization as well. Isa first, then. And Thank I you. think it's um, helpful if you also tell us who you'd like yes, particularly yes, to ask yeah. the question. Um, Rafael Giltienda, Marsha McLean and Asia. Uh, Richard, thank you and the panel for uh, a very concrete and very, I, I think, broad discussion of the uh, impact on Asia of the potential risks. Um, I had a question perhaps for the, for the, for the minister and for the, 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 head, uh, the deputy head of the um, uh, central bank, but maybe also for the whole panel. Now, um, in, at the Oliver Wyman report, uh, beginning of the, of the year, one of the assessments on potential crisis by 2015 was if for exogenous reasons, and I think Michael was saying China is getting it right, okay? but if for exogenous reasons China were to have a significant slowdown, you would have a ripple effect in terms of drop in importation of commodities and uh, other resources, that would drop prices, that would affect the growth in the rest of Asia that primarily has been export-oriented and has been very well managed, Australia, all of Latin America. And frankly, it's one of the few good things ongoing in the world. The U.S. is dealing with its problems, so is Europe. Um, we concur with uh, Jeff's point that countries ought to have a chief risk officer and that probably the position in there should be somewhere in between the Ministry of Finance and the Central Bank. So I guess my question is how, you know, top of mind is this perhaps unlikely but potential uh, slowdown in China through some exogenous event in terms of uh, preparing for 
financial prudence. You know, we're seeing big investments in infrastructure here. Uh, uh, Stuart was referring to those in India. A lot of that carries long-term borrowing, you know. And so how effective are we in saying, okay, if there were to be exogenous, how well prepared are we in dealing with that maybe unlikely but potential event? Thank you. Minister, that was to you. Uh, thank you. Probably, if there is debt risk, uh, the slowdown of China, it will impact not only Indonesia but the region. But I can explain that the economy of Indonesia, we are not that dependent on export. If you look at our composition to support our GDP, 53% come from the household consumption, 30% from investment, 9% from the government spending, and only 2% from the net export minus import. So uh, we are not that dependent. We have to continue to uh, diversify our export. Uh, we continue to improve the domestic demand. So uh, we have to establish a chief risk officer in Indonesia to really monitor that. Uh, in Indonesia, we have the crisis management protocol in each institution, and we work closely. And in the crisis management protocol that always monitor the development of Indonesia, we understand several indicators need to be reviewed. For Indonesia, the most important thing is the current account deficit. Because in 97, 98, when there was an Asia crisis, if the crisis if the current account deficit is larger than 3%, it's already, it's already a warning signal for, for, for Indonesia. But we cannot just look at that. We have to look at the equity market, the government bond market. We have to review the property price, valuation of capital market, etc. And these indicators are monitored by the crisis management protocol, but it's even better if we have the risk and the, the country risk uh, officer who, 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 who monitored this. Infrastructure. Infrastructure is one of the, the, the challenges of Indonesia. In Indonesia, for the next five years, we need 1,400 trillion uh, rupiah for building our infrastructure. But unfortunately, our fiscal has limitation. We only have a slight fiscal balance. So we need to attract investors, foreign direct investment, domestic investors, from the 1,400 trillion rupiah investment in infrastructure that we need for the next five years, the government can only finance 20 to 30 percent. The remaining need to be participation of government working together with, with, with investors or uh, inviting investors. PPP initiative, public partnership, uh, public public-private partnership. We have introduced that for the last seven years. We are not that successful. But to me, I'm pleased that at least we have one uh, PPP in Central Java, $2 billion project that can be uh, executed. So with that, we can then replicate to others. So uh, I'm positive. I believe Indonesia can solve the infrastructure, but infrastructure is one of our challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Finance Minister. Next question. Gentleman there. Thank you to the panel. That was very insightful perspectives. Uh, my name is Sandeep Power from Barclays Capital, and I had a question for Michael and Stuart, perhaps. Uh, but uh, given, given that it seems like sovereign risk outweighs corporate risk, uh, in today's world. Uh, how concerned are you about politicians playing to the gallery and putting in further protectionism policies, and what does that mean for Asia, uh, if there are more protectionism policies in Europe and the Western world particularly? In terms of uh, protectionist sentiment, I guess there are two elements. One is, is sort of pure trade uh, protectionist sentiment, and there I think um, that's been a very real issue, although to be honest, I'm surprised that it hasn't or it wasn't more of a problem uh, during the depths of the crisis. Uh, given the unemployment increase in the US, one could have feared that the rise in protectionist sentiment there would be even worse. Uh, 
I think China is obviously the focal point for that, and that is one of the reasons that we are continuing to forecast a sort of 6 percent annualized depreciation of the currency, as we think that's enough to stave off some of that protectionist sentiment. But could that pick up if unemployment fails to decrease because growth is running at sort of trend or a little bit below? Yes, and that's, that's clearly a risk uh, and one that the strategic and economic dialogue between the US and China is going to be very, very important in trying to, uh, to, to, to reduce. Um, but I, I guess there's also uh, you know, questions over um, the sort of protectionist measures in the capital markets. And there I think uh, you know, there, there is a chance that governments want to keep more of the money at home so that they can control uh, the interest rate environment and effectively uh, you know, have some sort of an inflation tax, if you like, to erode the, the real value of, um, of outstanding, uh, outstanding debt. I think that that is a risk. It's not one that seems to be sort of happening yet, but we're, we're certainly, uh, you know, alive to, the, to, to those risks. And given the history of high sovereign debt, you know, that is often a way that uh, the, the countries choose to, to get out of that. Stuart. Yeah, I mean, the, I think the only thing I would add is, 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 is a kind of statement of the rather obvious, which is it, there are such huge global imbalances, it's impossible for countries to opt out of a a system where capital flows around the world, just as it's impossible for countries to opt out of a global trade system in essence. You know, if you look at the creditor nations versus the debtor nations, the debtor nations can't possibly fund themselves if they put up substantial capital barriers, as it were. However, if you're a politician, you will always play to the gallery, and there will always be a domestic agenda which is driven off unemployment, basically, which will cause the pendulum to swing backwards and forwards somewhat. But the idea that a major country could opt out entirely of the system, I think, is, is not possible. And, and maybe just one, one last uh, sort of thought on this is that you know, my previous job before I joined uh, Goldman back in 2000 uh, was at the IMF doing bond restructurings. And the, the rule of thumb uh, back then was always that any debt that was in uh, you know, was the debt that you wanted to restructure, and then you try and encourage uh, new flows. That doesn't seem to be the approach uh, that being, being taken thus far, uh, which uh, you know, is perhaps a, an illustration of the sort of political imperative rather than the economic one. There we go, gentlemen here. Thank you. My name is Pong Sak from uh, Sassin of Geelong Gone, Bangkok. Now, I would like to ask the panel, particularly the uh, minister and the, from the central bank, do you foresee any possibility of QE3 which is going to be surpassed whatever happened in QE1 and QE2? And is there any circumstances that Indonesia, like Thailand, which is small and open economy, would like to contemplate the capital control or any sort of, you know, in this degree of measure? Thank you. I'm going to put that first to the Deputy Governor. Very quickly, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I do, con uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the capital inflow is really uh, one of our focus uh, at the moment. And then what we've been doing so far is basically, um, uh, perhaps I will use the term is putting sand in the wheel very much, uh, rather than uh, to uh, to stop this very much to how all these things, the inflows, be manageable uh, internally, uh, taking into consideration our uh, challenges and also the stability on our macroeconomy. Thank you. I'm going to be minister first, and then uh, Stuart wants to jump in. Uh, in Indonesia, we are certain at the moment we don't have any plan for capital control. We believe that we have to strengthen our uh, fundamentals, our economy, the balance of payment, fiscal, uh, banking sector, real sector, and we would like to really uh, attract the portfolio investors so they can convert their portfolio to a more real sector initiatives. And uh, in the government, we believe that a prudent macroeconomic, monetary, and fiscal policies and better coordination is the key. So uh, we have that uh, position. 
Um, I agree completely with the minister. You don't want to put in capital controls. You want to develop your financial markets so that you don't attract hot flows that come into short-term assets, but you develop your bond markets. Effectively, therefore, the capital flows come in and they can be used in your economy to build out your infrastructure. So there's a financial market development requirement which then uses those capital flows productively for the economy of the country rather than responding to hot flows and keeping them out. You need to create the opportunities in your country to invest in ways that are productive for the economy. So I agree completely with what the Minister is saying. You should ask Goldman Sachs' view on QE3. <laughs> <laughs> that they'll know. Bear with I'm happy to talk to the uh, issue of whether there's QE3 rather than the YouTube, but, um, the, but the, uh, I, I think the threshold in which the Fed does nothing is very, very wide now. Um, and so on our baseline view, which is that the US continues to grow uh, at 3% and a little bit above uh, out through the end of 2012, uh, there would be no need for them to, to hike rates, certainly. So we have them, you know, even on our baseline case, not hiking until beyond 2012. If things are worse than that, though, I think they'd have to be a lot worse before you triggered another round of quantitative easing. The climate for additional quantitative measures is very, very different now from when QE2 was done. Um, and I think also the Fed's view of the success of quantitative easing 2 is sort of lower than their view of quantitative easing 1. Uh, and so the, the sort of marginal benefit for, for doing it is it looks a little bit lower and the marginal cost uh, of doing it looks quite a lot higher. So I think you know, growth could be quite a lot weaker than our forecasts and you know, a little bit stronger than our forecasts and you'd still end up with exactly the same answer, which is no QE3, but also no hiking uh, out into 2013. Rana Dayal from the Boston Consulting Group. Uh, it, it's uh, no, I don't think anybody would disagree with the broad view that we're not in a decoupled world. At the same time, uh, intra-Asian trade and intra-ASEAN trade in particular have been the fastest growing uh, components of trade over the last 10 years and look like they will continue to do so. So in that particular context, and this is a particular question for Park August, but uh, potentially for other people on the panel as well, uh, what opportunities do you see Park, in, from things like ASEAN 2015? Um, for example, does that create the opportunity for a broader based bond market that can uh, serve the needs of uh, ASEAN and help address some of the more specific uh, issues around bond, bond market development in the region as a whole? Uh, so in general, what does ASEAN 2015 do? Uh, and in particular, what might be uh, different ways of going at the bond market development issue uh, that has been a constraint uh, potentially on on financing and infrastructure. I know Stuart's got strong feelings on that, but I'm not going to ask him. I'm going to ask uh, Jeff to begin with, and we might get Stuart's views on it. So, the, uh, I think inter ASEAN trade is a fascinating point. What we've got to make sure is that it's not just part of the supply chain cycling around and it's still going to the West. And I think a lot of it is actually ingredient driven rather than consumption driven, which would be healthier. Uh, the, the growth of ASEAN bonds is essential for the reasons we've gone through, but unless you're trying to create, and I don't think anybody here is going to suggest an Asian euro, it's, those markets have to develop country by country. ASEAN can help, uh, fuel, help fuel some of it a little, but I think it's fundamentally a country issue. What ASEAN can do is continue to drive intra-regional trade and there's many ways that that can be driven forward even more aggressively than it's been done to date. Omar, very quickly. I would echo that and, and, and you know uh, also learn the lessons in terms of from Europe etc that the one-size-fits-all policy doesn't work but at the same time there needs to be coordination amongst all the ASEAN countries across trade across regulatory parameters and how they sort of design their policies because you know, hurting one economy can, or benefiting one economy can hurt the other. So I think that they're headed in the right direction. Stuart. Yeah, I agree with Jeff completely. Bond markets should be domestic currency, otherwise you're going to create the foreign currency borrowing issue that existed in 97, 98. Um, 
Uh, and I also agree that a lot of ASEAN trades the supply chain. So it's slightly misleading. Anybody else? There we go. Lady at the, uh, the maroon. Thank you. Good morning. Annie Ko, Singapore Management University. Um, great panel. I was just wondering, uh, last week, Tim Geithner criticized the Asian economies for not aligning their regulatory policies according to the guidelines laid out in the U.S. So I just wanted a two-part question for the Minister of Finance and for the Governor. How much of your domestic financial regulatory policies uh, aligned to ASEAN and how much of it to the U.S. and the rest of the world? Uh, for the leaders who run banks, I think you're one of the most heavily regulated industry right now. How do you balance the tension between home country regulations and host country regulations? Oh, I think Thank we could be, could be here all day for that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Minister, first. Uh, I think uh, I will also cover the previous uh, question. Uh, look at ASEAN. Uh, ASEAN, the 10 countries uh, in the ASEAN region, we are committed to the ASEAN Economic Community 2015. In the Ministry of Finance area, we have at least eight groups that discussing the possibility of creating a larger and uh, more effective uh, ASEAN uh, region. It starts from the customs discussion, financial institution discussion, capital market uh, discussion, insurance, and others. And uh, we have, you know, the scorecards. So it needs to be monitored, and it is monitored from time to time. So we will have the the, 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 the effective ASEAN Economic Community 2015, and it's a great potential for, 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 for ASEAN and, and the global uh, community. In ASEAN, uh, we not only work in the 10 of us, but we also work with the ASEAN plus three, including China, Japan, and Korea. Uh, we basically have already established the Chiang Mai Initiative Mutualization. This Chiang Mai Initiative Mutualization basically mandated us to establish an ASEAN plus three macroeconomic research office. And this AMRO basically is an independent unit, an independent uh, regional surveillance unit that continue to assess each country's uh, macroeconomic. And if necessary, they make recommendation and also recommend a solution for the macroeconomic situation in uh, each uh, countries. We have pool 120 billion uh, swap currency swap uh, facility to basically uh, support the stability of the ASEAN plus three uh, community. And for uh, improving uh, regulations, we are in the process of continuous uh, initiative to improve uh, regulation, not only regulation, but also uh, standard uh, ethics and also uh, uh, standard uh, procedure uh, need to be uh, aligned. Uh, one other thing that I would like to express is the, the Asian bond market. In the ASEAN plus three initiative, we also uh, in the process of uh, finalizing the Asian bond improving Asian bond market, basically allowing uh, corporates in ASEAN plus three countries to to support them in issuing uh, local currency uh, uh, bonds. And the, 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 the ASEAN plus three will establish a special guarantee uh, unit or guarantee fund to support that initiative, the Asian bond market. Probably that's what I can explain, thank you. Deputy Governor, if you can be very brief on that. Yes, the regulatory alignment is uh, uh, something uh, uh, continue to be discussed in the G20 because I do believe that the, this is also reflection that some disagreement still uh, remain uh, to some extent over here, over there, you know, in, in much, very much detail. But I, I do agree that the uh, financial regulatory alignment is, is, is really something to uh, be agreed on in the future. Uh, Indonesia is a member of G20, and then we are also uh, uh, subject to be uh, reviewed by, by our peer uh, with other members. I think 
we are, as our minister uh, earlier mentioned, that we are progressing quite well as far as the regu regulatory uh, reform concern, in particular related to the liquidity and the strengthening of our uh, capital in, in, in banking industry. Uh, we are involving a lot of uh, international best uh, standard on this, and then uh, I, I do believe, um, well, at least based on the independent review by the World Bank and the IMF under the financial sector assessment program just been finalized very recently. Indonesia quite successful on that adding. And then I think you can see on the, their website because we, 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 we also uh, discuss this with this group. So we, we don't think we do have a problem with this alignment. We, of course, uh, we have our uh, point of, different point of view from very much uh, emerging market point of view. But at least we are, uh, work very hard to uh, start aligning all, all these things with this uh, current regulatory uh, reform. Thank you. Jeff, very quickly as well. Just to go to the uh, home versus host issue, which I think is a complex issue. It starts with the, the systemic risk issue. And uh, I think the key issue on systemic risk is you've got to look to activity more than size. And activity is what needs to be understood from the systemic risk point of view. The other issue that comes into play is guarantees. And if we look at Ireland and Iceland, guarantees became a big issue. In general, I don't like guarantees. I think they create uh, moral hazard, but it's very difficult for us. Once they're in place, we're not going to get away from them. If home versus host is going to work, I think you've got to say guarantees are host-driven rather than home-driven. Otherwise, uh, small economies with large institutions have a, an insolvable problem. So you're, as the bank boss, that's... Um, we're in 80 countries. There are two or three regulators in each. So there's 200 odd regulators that regulate us. Um, we are an industry, as you rightly say, that's heavily regulated. That's perfectly understandable given the global financial crisis. And we have to basically hit the regulatory hurdle in both the home and the host nation. Uh, there's a college of regulators. Uh, so the regulators themselves who cover HSBC coordinate. Uh, so it actually is pretty well organized by this stage. The College of Regulators who supervise HSBC met last week in London, hosted by the FSA and myself and um, our chief financial officer and a number of other senior colleagues presented to them. Um, it's just the way it is. Uh, just a completely separate point, if I may. The, and this is something to think about, which is whether institutions are systemic, create systemic risk, or actually it's asset classes. One of the arguments you can make is a lot of the, the financial crisis that took place in the United States came out of subprime lending. It's actually asset classes that create systemic risk, and therefore it's popping the bubble by using macroprudential tools that we believe is actually one of the ways that the Western central banks need to adopt some of the best practice from Asia. So, for example, the things that you saw the HKMA announce this week, which is restricting lending on properties above, I think, 10 million Hong Kong, that you've got to put 50% equity down, and if you're not from Hong Kong itself, you've got to put 60% equity down. Those type of macroprudential tools we totally welcome because we think those get to the nub of asset classes and asset bubbles, and it's actually asset classes that create systemic risk, not institutions. And the way to pop those is macroprudential rather than monetary policy or simply holding larger and larger amounts of tier one equity. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for. I'm going to ask one more question of uh, the panel. I'm going to start off with Omar Lodi, and it is uh, within, within the realms of decency, uh, what, geez, what keeps you up at night in an economic sense, obviously? I think, uh, I, I, I think the West and, uh, you know, going from a, a long drawn out sort of low growth, anemic growth environment, which hopefully is the likely and expected outcome to a more Armageddon type outcome in terms of, uh, you know, a severe sovereign crisis, currency crisis. That's probably what I would hold up. Deputy Bank Governor. Well, I think what happened in Greece and the U.S. economy and also the uh, oil price is very much the, uh, very much the, uh, what, what I suppose the day-to-day uh, -day concern of, of, of our citizens. I sort of agree with Omar, but I'd just add to that that it's uh, the political search for short-term answers 
is dangerous. People need to take a long-term holistic view before they act. Uh, I agree. Uh, energy prices, food uh, security is an issue. Inflation is also a challenge. Uh, but uh, prudent macroeconomic, fiscal and monetary policies and better coordination among regions is the key. Thank you. The political environment in the Middle East and its impact on oil prices. Uh, I agree with, with all of the concerns raised, so I guess I'm not getting much sleep tonight. Uh, maybe just to throw another one in there uh, is, is uh, the sort of Chinese property market growth nexus. You know, clearly what China is trying to do is cap any increases in nominal house prices. You get 20% wage growth for a few years and you grow out of the affordability problem. Uh, that is our baseline assumption. But if growth falls enough, you don't get the income growth, uh, and then all of that could unravel. Ladies and gentlemen, Sam, uh, thank you so much for attending. Uh, we just run out of time. Uh, just please give it up to, to, for the panel, please. Thanks. And uh, if anybody's got any headphones, can you please uh, don't forget to leave them by the door. Thank you.